this and going, well, that's not the talk it says in my program book. Correct. Stop reading the, uh, the timetable in your program book. It's wrong. You want one of the loose piece of paper or the one of the laminate and the other side of the door. How you know? So, um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Mike Whitaker. Um, I used to work for BBC. I don't do anymore. Um, I'm now working for Love Film. Um, I'll prepare to Britain, in fact, which is kind of nice. Uh, uh, I'm doing, doing operations on some of our back end systems. So, uh, what prompted this talk? Uh, well, they're back end systems. They've been around a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's not giggling. Um, and they're, they're, they're really lovely. They're all, all just, I, in view of what I'm going to be saying in this talk, not all of our code is like this, trust me. Um, it's Mason! Yay! Um, and Pearl! Yay! Uh, and Betty for SQL! Yay. Ooh! Um, which, which, I did one of my immediate reactions was, oh my god! <laughs> and it's the usual mix of beautifully clean stuff with line parameters and crap with color selections built up on the fly. And, and it wants a refactor. It badly needs a refactor, and, and we, we, my boss is, is reasonably amenable to this happening. But to do that, one of the things I need to track down is all the SQL queries, um, all the tables they use, and also how they use it. Because some, you know, we have read and write databases, and sometimes you want to know that this class only ever uses it in read mode, so on and so forth, and catch some of our uh, more unpleasant query problems if we can. So, tools. You could use RAC or ACK, um, which is all very well, except there are all multi line queries. Some of them are built up from thing.list or thing.vac, some of them are here docs. Um, so, so that basically, yeah, you can grab it, but you have to pass the damn thing afterwards. Um, so, yeah, it's not the world's brightest solution. It's great. That wasn't the first clue about pass syntax. So, I thought to myself, how about we use PPI? Because PPI is cool. PPI is, is much better. And PPI actually knows about Perl syntax. <laughs> uh, so, what is PPI? Uh, it apparently was originally past Perl isolated. Um, but uh, Adam Kennedy, who wrote it, didn't want to get RSI for every kind of class name he typed. Um, so, in the best tradition of all the Perl three letter acronyms like DBI and the rest of them, um, it became PPI. Uh, it's I pass Perl backwards. I uh, first pull forwards, but back, you know what I mean. And, and the, it's, the back for an image pull passing my face. It's a part of pull documents, and this, there's a slight important distinction here between what PPI does and what the pull, pull interpreter does. PPI does not claim to be perfect, um, in part because perfection is a real bastard. Well, it is in fact impossible, as you can tell from the fact we do it every day. <laughs> um, to quote Randall Schwartz among other people, um, the only thing that actually passes Pearl is Pearl. Insert capital letters to taste here because they're quite important. Anybody who hasn't appreciated the distinction between Pearl capital P the language and Pearl P the binary that passes it, now's a good time. Um, because there are some really fun edge cases when you try and pass Pearl. For example, What's that slash about to be? Is it division? Or is it start with reg -ex? I mean, let's assume that foo is a bad word, it's sub. What's that, what's that slash about to be? Let's see, it could be. Let's suppose foo is in fact a function that takes one argument, then that is foo on the result of reg -ex. <laughs> If foo is a function that takes no arguments, then that's foo, the result of foo divided by dollar a and the rest is common. But you can't tell without knowing what foo is. That's great, in fact, that's no problem, we can still pass Perl. All we have to do is make sure that we keep track of what our function prototypes are. <laughs> <laughs> right! Pass <laughs> that, you bastards! <laughs> you can do it at runtime, because by the time you get to that statement, you know which prototype foo you defined, but given a static Perl document, you have the proverbial kids chance in hell. So, uh, passing Perl is impossible. Passing Perl as a document is not, and by that I mean tokenizing it, going through, picking out the syntax, and so on and so forth, provided you're prepared to accept good enough. 
Uh, and you might think, well, that's not really very useful. Uh, but it is, actually, because, yeah, sure, if you want to pass Perl, you've got Perl binary. If you want to pass Perl documents, then something like PPI becomes very useful. You can use it for refactoring. You can, for instance, ask PPI to find you all the methods in a class. Uh, OK, there are ways of doing that using the Perl binary. But if you don't want to use the Perl binary for whatever reason, you can go through and find all the subs. Uh, you can extract documentation <coughs> if you're doing something sort of javadoc style. Oops, sorry, I swore. Um, you can pull out javadoc style stuff for every, every method. Uh, display. Uh, you can pretty print easily enough. OK, so it has a little headache with the previously mentioned example, but I've not yet seen an, an editor mode that would cope with that every time reliably. You can do syntax highlighting. Um, Padre is in it. Well, the cool one, um, the wonderful Perl Critic, which uses uh, PDI to hack its way through Perl and figure out what horrible things you've done. Now, your mileage might vary on Perl Critic. I like it as a tool. I think Damien Conway's suggestion suggestions are full of crack. But it does work. So, using PPI, it's dead simple, actually. I'm surprised. When I came to write my little tool to pull out SQL queries, I was surprised how easy this was. So, use PPI, use PPI dumper for reasons which become rapidly apparent. Create a new Perl document from a file. And it's as simple as that. Dollar PPI is now a, Perl, a PPI document object. Uh, and you'll see what we can do with that in a bit. <coughs> Alternatively, you can pass it a, a, a string ref, a scalar ref, which is some code you actually want to pass. Now, this actually proves quite useful to us. <coughs> we have an awful lot of code that's sitting in percent init section within Mason. And while I did have a brief moment about considering subclassing the Mason parser and feeding PPI in there to try to find out what was going on, I decided that my sanity was, uh, my sanity was left of my non gray hair uh, was probably better off used for other reasons. So uh, the code I have actually has some cheeky little code that pulls out the contents of percent view sections, tries to keep track of what line number they start with that and feeds them into PPI that way. Um, once you've done that, you can simply say, my dollar dumper equals PPI dumper, the PPI object. And for the sake of the example, let, let's pull out everybody's favourite little code sample, slightly shortened to fit in a three column layout. You shove that into PPI and dump it, and you get that up, which is more, perhaps more useful and less confusing than it looks. It does actually pair up. And fundamentally, what PPI gives you back is a tree structure of PPI objects, uh, each of which have a useful method representing the things they are. Now, the hierarchy, if you start with PPI element, everything's a PPI element. That has a couple of subclasses, one of which is PPI node. PPI node is the things that contain other nodes uh, of various types. And, and the, three, the three subtypes of those are PPI document, which is, we've already seen, is a complete file of some Perl code. There's PPI statement, which is any series of tokens and statements that are treated as a single continuous statement by Perl. There is PPI structure, whoops, sorry, PPI structure, which is fundamentally anything between a set of braces of any kind. And then on top of that, as a subclass of PPI element, I've got those dots lined up right. Um, we have PPI token, which is basically <laughs> things like dots, dollars, semicolons, yada yada yada. So, that previous slide is a bit wordy. So, let's take advantage of some of the nice things PPI allows us to do and prove the document in all its white space. Uh, it did occur to me that, that this does mean that whatever you use PPI, if you really want, is you can do code obfuscation with it. <laughs> Basically, keep track of all your bad words, replace them with obfuscated bad words, uh, and print out again. The nice thing about the PPI document tree is when you get to, out, get to output, it produces exactly what you gave it. Um, modular doing things like this to it, of course. But having done that, we now have a tree that's missing its white space and only contains useful syntax elements. So, what have we got? First line we've got is the usual hash bang line, and that turns out to be a client. Um, that's PPI token comment. Um, the next line is print high. That um, is PPI statement expression. Um, and that breaks down um, into um, 
if you are to open Bellwood, which is print. Now, obviously, if you're doing off the schedule, you want to not off the schedule singles, unless you want to rename them. Um, but that's Bellwood. The next thing is PPO structure list. As I said, PPO structures are anything within braces, so that's PPO structure list. And then we have a PPO token structure uh, to finish. Now, all the, oops, sorry, all the, um, most of the classes have a content method which allows you to see. So if I was to go that semicolon little referencing object arrow content, I get semicolon back. Um, now that structure list is a hierarchical thing, and inside it, it's got another PPO statement expression because all lists contain PPO statement expression. And inside that, there is <coughs> PPO token called double. And that's basically the, break, the past tree breakdown of print high. And in a similar nature, if you look at exit at the end, that's very similar. It's a PPO statement expression, it's a PPO token bare word. And there's an empty PPO structure list and a PPO token structure, which is a semicolon. It's great. So you can see it's a very simple example, but we can build up very easily a pass tree. And then PPI gives us lots of cool ways of walking through it. For example, PPI find. We can give it a um, we can give it a node type and type find all the nodes of that type, and it can just return us an array ref containing all the nodes of that type. Um, again, the nodes also contain useful content text information like the line number they appeared at and the column number they appeared at, so you can use that to find them afterwards. Uh, there are one complex way of doing that. PPI find will take a sub, so if you need to do if you need to do clever stuff in a code graph to figure out what you're actually looking for, like say you could look for all the semicolons, if you were sufficiently insane, PPI token structure arrow content equals semicolon, for example, and that would get you all the semicolons. But what I wanted at that point was all the quote strings. Cool. And I could I could have done this as part of the find the find code graph, but instead let's do it separately. Um, basically, for each of the nodes, get thing arrow string and see if it matches obvious looking SQL statements. Uh, and then put the results in a hash uh, with line number. At this point, I now at least I, I can print out a table that says, Here are your SQL, here's your SQL. I've got all the places where SQL strings are defined and all the line numbers. And if I were doing more than one file, I'd say the file as well. Uh, oh, yeah, that's all pretty well. But obviously enough, even that trips up over, for example, the simple case of somebody's built up a um, SQL statement by doing that, which does happen. So PPI also gives us some nice features for walking the pass tree. All PPI nodes of us have a <coughs> PPI element, and that gives us usefully next sibling, which is the next one along on the same level, previous sibling, and content, obviously enough. All the nodes that contain other nodes, the children of a PPO node, and those have no parent, no narrow children. So we can do fun stuff walking the past tree. For example, given that, that's PPO token quote double. If we go next sibling on that, we get the dot. If we go next sibling on that, we get another PPO token quote double for the rest of it. And then we get another token structure which tells us we're done. Um, so, um, and I have done this, um, we can hang on to our token, hang on to so once we've found our string, we can walk down the tree, walk across the tree on the one level. Um, if we find a semicolon, we're done. If we find a dot, skip it. If we find a quoted string, um, then append it to what we've already got. And then the hairy bit, if we find anything else, Show it in the SQL as a code fragment. <laughs> um, I'm sure there are there are more clever things one could do with that, but I was quite surprised to find that, that running effectively that plus a little bit of jiggery poker in the resulting SQL allowed me to get 95% of the SQL we have embedded in all our rubbish. Yes. I was going to say that that effect was fairly standard in terms of constant folding. I'm kind of surprised that no one's stuck on the C band yet to take a PPI document and constant fold the constants. It's tempting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. There's something for you to do. <laughs> um, this, is, this, is, this is great, but we've still got SQL. But now comes the fun bit. Now we've got SQL, we can pass it. 
because SQL statement is really quite cute. SQL statement is designed for things like, is actually designed for writing some of the, the really low level funky things like DVD, CSV, <coughs> sorry, DVD, yeah, DVD, DVD, CSV, DVD, 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 what does that previous one sorry, do when you've got a variable? Uh, currently, it sticks it in the string. <laughs> As dollar value. As dollar value. Okay. Um, I, I, I actually got away with murder there because it turned out that, that, the, most, that the most common two variables we had in our code were dollar where and dollar order. <laughs> so I replaced them with, I, I replaced them with w, w where clauses and W order clauses for reasons which will become apparent very shortly. Excuse me, skipping through the next slide. Uh, so, having done that, <coughs> we have da, 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 sorry about that. Um, we have SQL statement. The nice thing about SQL statement is it's got quite a nice little anti-SQL part built into it, which is quite sweet. So what we can do is create an SQL parser, have a go at parsing it. If it fails to parse, flag some some crap that says, "Oh, this is not good. Shouldn't have happened like that." Um, you appear to have a, 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 an SQL statement that's going to take a little handling. Otherwise, we can do things like ask the parse statement for what tables it uses. We can ask it what columns it by, <laughs> and stuff like that. So, without too much magic, we can actually write a little script that finds what files use what tables in our, in our horrible legacy SQL. Um, so, what can we do from there? World's well, your oyster, really. Um, there's that horrible stuff with shoving in something like a underscore code fragment does cause um, SQL statement to trip up. Again, I found that the most common one we have for that is either building up where clauses or building up col columns, and you could apply a little intelligence to the, to the parser to put in some dummy code to make a SQL statement actually parse it. Um, but I was quite surprised that that, that combination of PPO and SQL statement did in fact get some sense out of about 95% of the SQL we have embedded in our Perl and Mason files, which makes it actually really quite handy for refactoring. Um, I guess that's pretty much what I've been doing with DPO and SQL statement. Um, given I have myself three minutes here, a quick and shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> Mark made me do four talks out of the six I gave him. I'm allowed a shameless plug. Um, we're hiring, mostly ponies. Um, Plenty of agencies for mid-level and senior level Perl backend devs, some of which will involve playing with our lovely latest in Perl, some of which will be some more new and shiny stuff. Uh, we also after a couple of devs with Apache Solar experience, if you've got it. Um, also, the digital team are hiring some a lot of what the stuff they have uses Moose, um, uses DBLTC, stuff like that. Uh, mostly in North Acton, I suspect that if you were on the backend team and asked nicely and wanted to work in Peterborough, like me, um, you could do. Um, if you're at all interested, uh, come catch me anywhere around the <coughs> any, anywhere around the conference, or I'll be sitting around at the job fair for at least some part of this afternoon. I may decide to go to MST's talk, so it's probably worth catching me in the earlier half of the job fair. But more than interested, more, more than willing to talk, ask me any questions you like, um, and there you go.